Sorry about that interruption. <laughs> Let's continue. So if you remember, uh, they're going to the forge to make some axes to cut down the cedars. Come, my friend, let us hide to the forge. Let them cast us hatches in our presence. They took each other by the hand and hide to the forge, where the smiths were sitting in consultation. Great hatchets they cast, and axes weighing three talents apiece. Great daggers they cast, two talents apiece were the blades. One half a talent, the crests of the handles. Half a talent apiece, the dag a piece, the dagger's gold mountings. Gilgamesh and Ankudu bore ten talents each. I wonder how long a talent is. I assume it's like, like this. Ten talents of metal weapons. He bolted the sevenfold gates of Uruk. He convened the assembly. The crowd gathered round in the streets of Uruk, the town square. Gilgamesh seated himself on his throne. In the street of Uruk, the town square, the crowd was sitting before him. Thus Gilgamesh spoke to the elders of Uruk, the town square. Hear me, all elders of Uruk, the town square. I would tread the path to Herocious Humbaba. Ferocious Humbaba, I would seek the god whom men talk, whose name the lands do constantly repeat. I will conquer him in the forests of cedar. The let the land learn Uruk's offshoot is mighty. Let me start out. I will cut down the cedar. I will establish forever a name eternal. Whoa. One more time there. I will conquer him in the forest of cedar. Let the land learn Uruk's mighty offshoot. Let me start out, I will cut down the cedar. Let me start out, I will cut down the cedar. I will establish forever a name eternal. That, <laughs> that is humanity right there. <laughs> the, the, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, a little too excited to explain this. Um, <laughs> this is one of the earliest instances we see of this idea. Um, this really remarkable idea that that uh, is with us still today, immortality through objects, right? So this is what's going to be Gilgamesh's major quest. The whole you know point of this epic isn't about slaying Humbaba. Slaying Humbaba is a metaphor for a much deeper quest, more metaphysical quest, the quest for immortality. Um, and we can look at immortality as as a, a a very like selfish thing like oh me in this body I'm going to live forever but if you look at religious doctrines what you see is they talk about immortality in a very different way right immortality doesn't mean living for a very 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 long time it means living beyond time trans time <laughs> that's what immortality means that's what eternal life means and what we see here is that right at the onset eternal life is conflated with material manipulation, right? Because that's what life is, right? I'm, I'm material here. I've got material in me. It's moving around. My blood is circulating through my body and through the process of all of this material moving around in a particular pattern, I become me. Life is material manipulation. And, and so it's easy to see this fallacy or not quite fallacy that let me start out. I will cut down the cedar. I will establish forever a name eternal. So the idea is we can go out into the world and we can do things. We can take advantage of the resources at our disposal. And in doing so, we will establish an eternal name. Now, there, there's a lot of problems with this idea, you know, materialism, right? So, you know, greed, materialism, all this stuff. But then there's something else, which I would like you to pause for a moment and consider the medium in which we are communicating in. What I'm doing here, right, is I'm taking my thoughts and my ideas and I am projecting them into this material object. I'm staring at it right now. It's made of plastic and glass and silicon and electrons and wires and all this material crafted in this very particular way. We have to cut down the cedar forest to do it so that I can record my image and put it somewhere where it will stay like this eternally for all time. This is crazy. <laughs> so there is some truth in the idea that we can we can create ideas about ourselves. We can project ourselves into these external material objects and achieve a kind of immortality. Right? This isn't this isn't the trans kind of immortality that I talked about earlier. It's not the kind of immortality that Buddha talks about necessarily, but it's a kind of immortality. Uh we're reading about Gilgamesh, <laughs> you know? This man, maybe he never existed. There was probably some king who he's based off of, even if the king wasn't named Gilgamesh, right? But 
you know, there's, there's some sliver of historical truth to this character. Tiny little sliver. He, there was a king in Uruk. And we're still talking about the king of Uruk 6,000 years after that king was king because of material manipulations that his civilization was able to do because they took advantage of the natural resources of the world, like these cedars. And in order to do so, you have to slay the ogre Humbaba. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's... <laughs> This is a very important line. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, this is so, so for, for Tablet 2, this is going to be the theme question for Tablet 2. Tablet 1 was this question about divine femininity. Tablet 2 is, uh, I'll be read the line again. Ponder this line, okay? Let me start out, I will cut down the cedar, I will establish forever a name eternal. So my questions for you to put in comments are, what is immortality? And how is immortality related to the material world? This, these, these are our questions. Very big questions. They don't have answers, but I'm curious what you think. What is immortality and how does immortality relate to the material world? Okay. I will conquer him in the forest of cedar. Let the land learn Rook's offshoot is mighty. Let me start out. I will cut down the cedar. I will establish forever a name eternal. Then Gilgamesh spoke to the young men of Uruk the Sheepfold. Hear me, O young men of Uruk the Sheepfold! O young men of Uruk who understand combat! Bold as I am, I shall tread the distant path to the home of Umbaba. Humbaba, I shall tread the distant path to the home of Humbaba. I shall face a battle I know not. So that I can gain immortality and bring back cedars for my city. I'm a fool. You must know I'm a fool. I'm, I'm just totally... I'm a fool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I shall ride a road I know not. Give me your blessings as I go on my journey, so I may see again your faces in safety to return glad at heart through Uruk's gate. On my return, I will celebrate New Year twice over. I will celebrate the festival twice in the year. Two New Years in one. Look at that. More, more, more. Everybody gets one. The festival. Let the festival take place. Let the merriment begin. Let the drums resound before Wild Cow Ninsan. All right. So let me give you a little historical backdrop for this. In almost every ancient civilization in, in the Near East and in... in in the world, basically, there were annual New Year's festivals. These were a big deal because they set, they represented the intersection of life and death. Uh, they, you know, it was the cycling the moon, the cycling of the sun, just sort of like eternal cosmic cycles. We can talk more about time in a bit. Uh, this this theme of like what is immortality and and mankind's developing perception of time. Uh, that'll be a theme for later. But to to get a hint of it now. The, these New Year's ceremonies were, were really, really important because they were a time, they, they were a marking of a calendar and they were a time of the people of the city to remind themselves that they were part of an eternal cycle. This was the purpose of the New Year's ceremony. Often it resulted in the, in, in really ancient times, it resulted in the, de in the, in the sacrifice of a king and um, then a new king would be instantiated, or maybe it would be the sacrifice of a peasant uh, in substitute. First, at first it was kings. The god kings were sacrificed. That's a, an interesting thing. So these New Year's festivals were really, really important, and they come down to us in our day. So the, the god king was sacrificed and then was replaced by a new king <laughs> during a three-day festival. Does that sound familiar? Well, Jesus Christ <laughs> was killed on the cross, and three days later he was reborn anew. Um, the moon also goes through a three-day period. There's a crescent this way, and then there's nothing, and then there's a crescent this way. So this new year would often be held on the new moon, right, uh, during, during one of the solstices or the equinox, and, um, and it represented this, this sort of like mythic solidarity between finite time and infinite time through recognition of eternal cycles. So, so think about what Gilgamesh is trying to do here, right? He says, we're going to have two New Year's festivals in one. So he's trying to speed up time. He's trying to command time, 
right? This is, this is a crazy thing, right? So he's the king. He can just dictate the way that the festivals go, but the festival is supposed to reflect the cosmic rhythm of the universe. So Gilgamesh is trying to take control of the cosmic rhythm of the universe. He's trying to achieve immortality for himself. And of course, ultimately, he's going to fail. Um, but what you see in these hero narratives is a change in the way that we perceive time. I guess I'm giving this talk now, not later. What you see in these hero narratives is a way in which we, in which humanity perceives time. So prior to the hero, for thousands of years, the cities would have this, these, um, this death and rebirth New Year's ritual where the king might be killed and then reborn. And then Gilgamesh is sort of a response to that. He says, no, 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 you're not going to kill me. I'm going to achieve immortality, right? And so there's this, there's, a, there's two kinds of time that we see today in the big religions of the world. In the Western religions, right? This is a Western, this is early Western religion. You see that time is linear, right? Jesus the Messiah is going to come and he's going to make a heaven on earth. Future, history has a beginning and history has an end. Whereas if you go into the East, if you go into, say, Hindu mythology, history doesn't have a beginning and an end. It's just this eternal cycle, always round and round and round. And the goal of the samsara goal, the goal is to break samsara, to achieve nirvana and break out of that cycle. Uh, but in the West, right, we don't, we don't have this sort of same understanding of the cyclical knowledge of time where we believe that we could control it through our heroic deeds. So we're going to go into the forest and we're going to cut down the trees and we're going to use the matter to achieve our immortality. And so history is going to be made. I am a king. These are my great deeds. Um, yeah, so, so that, that, that's a lot there. <laughs> uh, I should make a new video, but I'm just going to read that that sequence one more time so we recognize like what Gilgamesh is trying to accomplish here with his his killing of Humbaba. On my return, I will celebrate New Year twice over. I will celebrate the festival twice in a year. Let the festival take place, the merriment begin, let the drums resound before the wild cow in sun. Right? Because he's going to go and achieve immortality and then he has control of time. Alright, so this was a long chapter, 12 minutes. I want to keep them under 10. So, uh, we're going to do the next one in a moment. <laughs>